And then uh, out of all of them on that wall, is the baseball bat your favorite gun? It's... <laughs> oh, you're a Walking Dead fan. Oh, damn! What? Oh, that's that's <laughs> nuts, dude. That's awesome. Holy crap. Uh, Lucille, did, baby. Yeah, Lucille. Did you make that? No. Uh, um, oh, I, his name's going to escape me now, but... Um, a a guy made them at, and he was at Shot Show one year and was uh, selling them. So I bought one and um, I saw it. I was like, oh, I gotta have one. And so he was ma- like, he's making them legit. Like I, I think that I want to say that like the producers of The Walking Dead saw them and they're like, those are better than ours. Like they're <laughs> way better. Like those are props. This one's real. Oh, that's awesome! Holy crap! So, it was back when I spent money like I was dumb and and just like, oh, I gotta have that. You you had overseas money? You mean back then? No, home? this is when I was still on active duty. Oh, okay. All right. Nice. That's awesome. Um, so like do you miss the beard? Uh no, not really. No, no. <laughs> you look so different without it. <laughs> We're no, uh, it, it was it was fun. It was cool to have, and it you know, it set me apart, I guess, or made me stand out, if you will, but at the end of the day, it wasn't, you know, it's not who I am necessarily. Oh, sure. I was okay getting rid I had a cool stash for November, though. Did you? Straight up, like, pedo stash. <laughs> did you Did you drive a, 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 a van around that said free candy on the side? No, 737, if that counts. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't say free candy on the side, though. No, it didn't say free candy, but, yeah, it was how a do, killer stash. How do you like flying around the 737? It's awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just as much work as the, as the King air was in the sense that like, it, it keeps you honest. It's um, it is not automated. Um, you know, we were flying that thing before we put people on the moon. That's how long the 737 has been around. Jeez. So it's, it's an older airplane and it's, it's, uh, it's got some older automation. It's got some newer automation that they're adding to it. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's just another airplane. It's cool to fly, fun to fly. Sure. Sure. How does it handle uh, compared to the Kinger? Um, I would say probably like, so when I first started flying it, I'll be honest with you. I like in the sim, I was okay. But like when I got out on the line, I was doing OE and stuff. Like I was under controlling the airplane. I was so nervous. This is the first time I'd ever had people in the back of the airplane. Like I wasn't used to flying except for, you know, a couple of crew members in the back. Yeah. So I was like super timid on the controls and, and the controls are heavy. Um, they're definitely like you've got to you've got to you got to fly it you've got to manhandle it i guess if you will yeah i've heard people um way more experienced than i uh talk about <clears throat> airbus is like uh computers um and then boeing's are more like pilot aircraft is that like you know being the 737 is it like literally you have to fly the aircraft where is it you know if, on the airbus side is a little bit more automated or do you have any experience on yeah that airbus well, i don't have any Air- airbus experience but talking to my buddies it's definitely um uh, it's more of a gentleman's aircraft if you will more sure. uh, more finessed um that but the, yeah the 737 it's a man's like it's a it's a pilot's aircraft like you've got to fly it and you can't like you can't let it get ahead of you because you will get behind that thing and it'll it'll screw you. Like okay. it will try to screw you over. Um, uh, so you just gotta be on top of it. And but it's it's I guess it would say it keeps you honest. It's an honest airplane, it does exactly what you tell it to do. Okay. All and right. it's not smarter than you by any means. It <laughs> thinks it is. It thinks it is, but no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Okay. What was the I don't know, the hardest uh for you? Like, what was the hardest part about transitioning into the 737? So you know, for, for me, it was the first jet I'd ever flown. Okay. So I went from a King Air being the biggest thing I'd ever flown to sure. a 737. And and I guess I was used to, you know, my Army background. I was used to them, I wouldn't say spoon feeding, but like the Army took a year to teach us how to fly helicopters. And, you know, most of the most of the, the major airlines, they're going to take about a month to teach you how to fly that jet. Okay. So they cram everything in there, which... I was expecting more of a spoon feed approach because that's kind of the way that, that the military was for me. Sure. And like, I this didn't a- show up as prepared as I could have been. So like the first day, you know, we're in the sim or the first time we're out there flying and the, and the instructor kind of steps back a little. And, and I remember him saying, Hey, you're going to use a speed brake. And I'm like, what's a speed brake? What the- yeah, what's <laughs> a speed brake? 
you know he's like yeah. it helps you slow down i'm like oh like props i got i know what a prop is yeah, yeah. <laughs> i could throw the props up high yeah where's the uh, where's the prop lever <laughs> yeah where's the prop lever? It's like throw that sucker up but <laughs> so just like the transition to the you know to the jet and, and sure. how to fly it's just so much faster it's so much slipperier slipperier um you know a buddy of mine from day one he was like hey remember you can't slow down and go down and okay. So that was, that's been, you know, that was a helpful thing at the beginning because when you're, you know, they keep you high or whatever, and you're trying to slow down because now they're controlling your speed and you got to go down, like it ain't going to work. Yeah. So you got to figure, you know, you just got to be ahead of the airplane and, and sure. it's it's different from flying, you know, 80 knots. And, you know, the first time you flew something, there's 150 <laughs> knots. You're like, holy crap, I'm, I'm behind the airplane. Oh, and sure. Yeah. Thing, you know, it's like, it's just moving so much faster. Oh yeah. No, that makes sense. How did you, so back up a sec, like, how did you first catch like the aviation bug? Um, you know, I, I grew up around it. My dad was an army aviator. He okay. was, um, he was actually, uh, he joined up to go to Vietnam and he was too young. And so by mm -hmm. the time he got through basic and ranger school, he went and got a ranger contract. Vietnam was over. He was a, uh, did rangers for a few years and he went to OCS and, um back then aviation wasn't a branch so he was an artillery officer flying hell chinooks oh wow um, okay and so i grew up around that and uh he passed away in an accident when i was young but mm. that yeah that put the bug in me of wanting mm. to be a helicopter pilot so growing up my whole life that's all i ever wanted to do is be a helicopter pilot that's cool. and so i actually followed his footsteps and flew chinooks in the army that's um cool. except at some point i realized that there was probably going to be a better opportunity to fly when I got out of the army, if I went sure. to fixed wing. So yeah. um, I had an opportunity to go fly King airs and I jumped on it. And, you know, I, I, I think I finished out with like 13 years active duty flying a King air. So, oh, wow. uh, so I was very fortunate with that. Yeah. So did you um, like go through like Rucker and, and train up, uh, you know, the, o, what is it? OH 58s or whatever. And then... yeah. So it, back when I went through uh, which was, May of 2000, I started flight school. Okay. 20, 23, almost 24 years ago. Wow. It seems like, and it seems like yesterday. It really does. No, but, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we did primary and instruments and a TH-67, which is a Bell Jet Ranger. That's right. And then um, after instruments, we went to basic combat skills, which was an OH-58 Alpha Charlie. So either Alphas or Charlie. Most of them are Charlies. And then we had Knights. And so we finished. And then once we finished Knights, flying goggles. We graduated flight school and then we went to our advanced aircraft qualification. So for me, it was a Chinook. So I spent another month and a half or however long it was uh, learning how to fly a Chinook. Where, where was the Chinook training uh, taking place? It was place there at Fort Rucker. Like everything's at okay. Fort Rucker. Oh, okay. Yeah. Even it's like Blackhawks and everything. They've just okay. got a different different stage field. So like you have to okay. go to different, you know, a different stage field where they're staged at. So the Apaches yeah. aren't where the Chinooks are. What was it like for you transitioning into the Chinooks? Um, I mean, I... I don't think I was cocky, but I was definitely like, I'm like, man, I, I can fly it. I can fly a helicopter. I'm like, I'm a pilot. I can fly, <laughs> you know, God's gift to aviation. Hell yeah. So, but it was, I mean, I remember getting on that the first day and, and being, you know, walking in the back of the ramp and it looked like it was two miles long. It was such a big helicopter compared to that bell jet ranger. Um, but I had some great instructors. I had a couple guys that were from the one sixtieth. Um, oh, I wow. got to fly with my, a guy that was going to be my company commander going forward when I got to Savannah a couple of years later. So lots of good instructors. They made it, uh, you know, they taught easy, I, I would say. I mean, it, it was, there were standards you had to meet. And when you met the standards, then we go out and have some fun and learn some things about the helicopter and what it could do. And, yeah. and so I don't remember it being like overly difficult. I remember the first day, like we were all flying with like earplugs, right? We put earplugs in, then we put our helmet on. Sure. And the first day I couldn't hear a thing because it's so loud in there and the earplugs were like quiet. So I went out and bought these little CEP things and now they issue to every, they issued them like two years after I bought them, but uh, $140 for a guy that makes like two grand a month. It was a lot of money. Oh, sure. Uh, so that was the hardest thing was just understanding the instructors. I couldn't hear a thing. Oh uh, yeah. But the, the, the Chinook, like, I mean, it, it's such a stable platform. It's a great mm -hmm. IFR aircraft. Uh, it flies itself. Like it, it'll it? almost fly itself. So, um, you know, learning how to do sling loads was new. And of course, that, but that continued, like I never stopped learning in that helicopter because it's just, it's such a capable helicopter and it's, it's so much fun to fly. Like if I could go fly a Chinook again, I, I would, I would definitely do it. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's so much fun. What was it like uh, flying the Chinook the first time? 
oh, I don't even remember honestly. I think I was just I was just like excited. I remember like I remember the first time I hovered, you know, like okay. like my nickel ride and my instructor took me up and I was like it, it was almost like a dream like holy smokes I'm 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 doing this. Like I'm yeah. actually here, you know, and I'm flying I'm going to fly a helicopter. And then the Chinook, I think it was the same. It was just bigger. It was like, all right, we're here. And this is, wow, this thing's huge. It's 100 feet long. I mean, this is a big helicopter. It is. They're massive. Um, so I just remember being like, I, I think it's just one of those, like, is this really happening is the way I felt. Yeah. Sure. Sure. What, um, in flying in either Chinooks or, uh, you know, your previous training, are there any particular flights that, um, are memorable or stick out to you or funny, um, that you're like, Oh crap, you know, I don't know, something that happened or. Besides flying with you. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> no, no like... um, I mean, you know, it's funny. Cause so like when I was doing interview prep to a couple of years, you know, I guess three years ago, almost. Sure. Or to get hired at the majors, um, I was trying to remember all those stories and and all those incidences, and I actually went back to my log book because sometimes I write little notes down about s- certain flights. Yeah. Um, but really, one that like I guess would stick out the most is we we ferried some King Airs over uh, from Korea to to Arizona. Oh wow! So, Did you go like north over like um, Reykjavik, Ke- Catholic Iceland? No, down? no, we went like um japan and then we jumped over to alaska oh damn okay all right yeah. so long flight and we had like, some we had some maintenance issues um which we could talk about later but sure. like training wise i just remember that there were at least two or three times where i was like they're gonna they're gonna fire me like they're gonna make me go be an infantry dude or something because i suck <laughs> you know we flew like our instruments was um the huey simulator so we flew like 90 hours in a Huey simulator. Okay. And I so it was like uh, the cockpit was completely different from a from a you know Bell Jet Ranger. And we had to like basically learn a little bit about about the gauges and what like what the limitations were, but we didn't have to know it. We just had to know how to fly instruments in that thing. And so that's how they taught us the basics of instruments. It was a full motion sim. Um, and I just remember feeling like my scan sucked, like. I really like, I, I, you probably know just well as I do, like we forget how hard it was when we first started. Oh yeah. You got, you know, you got a couple thousand hours under your belt. You don't realize how hard it was because you forget how hard it was. But I, I, you know, thinking back to training, I think like they're going to fire me. Like I suck. I am the worst person in this building. Like, why am I even here? You know, that's the way I felt. Yeah. I remember I didn't do very well on my instrument check ride. Mm. Uh, I think I got like a 80, which okay. like passing was like a 70 or something. But to me, like I'd always gotten like all A's, a little couple of B's sprinkled in there. And so yeah. like low B, almost a C, you yeah. know, number equivalent. I was, it was hard. Um, and I just, I was like, man, I suck at instruments. And so it really like set me back as far as confidence wise, instrument mm. flying, um, and then we went into the actual jet ranger and we flew instruments and I did a little better, but I mean, this is back when we were doing like intersection holding off of like two NDBs. Oh, you know, NDB, like, NDB holds were my nemesis. Uh, push the head, pull through. the tail. Oh my gosh. No. Yeah. Microsoft flight simulator. I kid you not. Microsoft flight simulator is the only reason why I passed my instrument uh, rating in helicopters. Like I couldn't for life of me do an NDB hold off of any, any radio. Like I just, it, it, and then um, toss in a wind, like it was just like uh, Greek. Yeah, I, yep. I, my brain couldn't do it. And then, you know, 20, 30 hours of sitting my ass in front of a computer, you know, with Microsoft Flight Simulator. And then I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Push. Yep. Yeah, interesting. Did you, so you uh, transitioned from Chinooks then into King Airs. Like how long were you in Chinooks for? So I was in Chinooks from 2000 to 2006. Okay, um, so six years, that's, that's pretty good. So Savannah? six years, but- well, I guess five years. So okay. I, I started the Chinook training like summer of 2001. Okay. And then I, so I was in helicopters for six years, Chinooks for five. Um, went to Korea right after flight school. Awesome experience. But like 9-11 happened like the day I got to Korea. I got to oh, Korea. Oh, shit. Friend. So um, it was weird. Like things were locked down and I was a brand new lieutenant. I didn't know. I didn't know left from right. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I was so dumb. 
had, had you gone for any like orientation flights at all or you literally no, just I was, arrived like literally i flew into to seoul and they put us in a hotel okay. and i was getting ready to go to bed that night so which it would have been like the night of the 11th oh wow which was the morning of the 11th so i went to bed th- like seeing the stuff on tv and thinking like oh wow we're gonna like is this place even gonna be here when i wake up in the morning like what's going on in the world and oh my uh gosh. And so, you know, they busted, like, I think they kept us up in Seoul for like five days and they bust us down to uh, our bases. So I was going to Camp Humphreys okay. and okay. Um, I, I mean, I worked my butt off. I had a phenomenal group of, of warrant officers. I mean, the warrant officers back then, the Wolfpack, um, you know, they, they, it, it was a different breed back then. They, they kept everything straight. They kept everyone honest, um, but they weren't afraid to lay down the law and realize that. Like when it came to aviation, they were, they were the Kings, mm-hmm. you know, I may have been in charge of them, but they were the experts. And so I had a couple of really good warrant officers take me under the wing and, and really um, push me and challenge me. And so I made pilot command while I was there, nice. um, which, and, and it was like the most surreal experience. Like, I guess I was like 24 years old or something, which was kind of old on the spectrum, I guess, but um and get the keys. Like they throw me the keys to the helicopter and say, Hey, go burn eight, you know, six, eight hours off it today. Yeah. Go take a couple guys out and go fly. So we go fly. Like we go all over that country. Oh, that's cool. It was what's, so much fun. What did, uh, what was your kind of mission there in Korea? Um, honestly, we didn't, I mean, we were troop transport supplies. Mm-hmm. Um, really our true mission was the non-combatant evacuation operation, Neo. Okay. So if the North Koreans moved, you know, try to come south, then we would move north and evacuate all the non-combatants, all the family members of people are stationed there, okay. all the U.S. citizens that are there. We would get up to whatever link up places we were at, and we would put as many people on the helicopter and fly them south. Okay. So that was our primary mission that we practiced for. Uh, we also did a lot of FARPs, um, forward air army and refueling points. Oh, okay. So sure. we would go out and like land in the middle of nowhere, and we'd call it a fat cow mission. And we'd roll the hoses out the back. We had Robbie tanks on the inside. And we'd oh, roll really? the out. And then, you know, Apaches would roll in and we'd refuel them and then they'd take back off. Oh, wow. How so much? So that was, we we're just a remember? support role, kind of whatever, whatever 8th Army needed. Okay, sure. Do you remember, uh, what was the max weight of the Chinook? Or do you remember it all? 50,000 pounds. 50,000. Oh yeah, my so gosh. we could fly around 50,000 pounds gross weight. Um, the one sixtieth theirs is a little bit heavier than that because they have different TBOs, same, same, like same engines and everything, but their TBOs are a little different. So, um, okay. they could fly it a little heavier, but we flew ours, you know, macro. So it was 50,000 pounds. Um, I want to say that the center hook could hold 20, I think it was 26,000 pounds. And then the four and a half together could hold like 25,000 pounds. Jeez. Um, and Hopefully no Chinook guys are on here. They're going to be like, those numbers are wrong. Well, it's they were not, correct like, for you, you know, 20 years ago. It's yeah, been a long though. time, but oh, yeah, yeah, online, yeah. it was an awesome yeah. aircraft. Like you could throw a Humvee inside it. Uh, you know, you could shotgun carry two Humvees on the outside. Damn. You can carry M105 howitzer, uh, <laughs> you know, gun. So like it, it's by far like the coolest aircraft. I think it's the best helicopter in the world. Wow. All right. Is there uh is there any fun characteristics or interesting characteristics with Chinooks that, um, up, you know, up close to the V and E, like if you were to exceed V and E, what, what would happen? Um, you know, I think you just get some retreating blades. Oh okay. yeah. It's been so long that I've, since I've even thought of any of this no stuff, but yeah, yeah. No um, worries. I mean, so yeah, up to V and E it's, it is the fastest helicopter in the army. I heard that. Um, yeah. You guys so, would have to slow down to let Blackhawks and, and uh, Apaches keep up with you or whatever. Yeah. If we were like, cause we were going 160, I think was our, it was our V and E. Wow. Um, maybe it was more, I don't remember. I tried to sure. yeah, flush that stuff when I learned. Oh, yeah. 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 Stuff. <laughs> Done. <laughs> what, uh, all right. Last question about Chinooks. What was overall your most favorite or mo- most memorable flight in the Chinook? Oh boy. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't even think of just one. Okay. Um, or you know, again, it was the people. Honestly, is the people because you know you're yeah. flying with two or three crew chiefs in the back. Um, you know, man in the doors on the for the guns if we're like overseas. Um, you know. Yeah. It was you know in stateside we flew we'd go out and just do training missions we do pinnacle landings and 
and sling load stuff. Um, a lot of times we'd like to sneak in and grab the Blackhawks like training block because they couldn't lift our block, but we could lift theirs. Theirs is a tiny little block, right? It's like just a big concrete cement block, right? Sure. And so we'd lift it, we'd pick it up and like move it and hide it to where they couldn't find it. Or we'd like move it to where it's a really <laughs> tight area. That, so that it's really hard for them to get in there. Um, you know, just kind of messing around stuff like that. Cause sure. they couldn't move ours. So they couldn't really mess with us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I got to take my brother up in the jump seat one time. Cause he really? was at the time. So I got to take him out flying around. That's cool. And, um, you know, overseas, I had the unfortunate but fortunate um, opportunity to to fly. Uh, you know, U.S. soldiers that were killed in action. Mm -hmm. uh, we you know evacuate their their remains out of the country, like in, mm -hmm. in two thousand three when I was flying during the invasion. So I guess I mean it wasn't the the most fun mission, but it was definitely a mission that had to be done. And so you know you treat it with the utmost respect and dignity you can, and and it's just a necessary thing that had to be, have, had to happen. So I, I feel fortunate to be able to at least do that. Sure. You said that, that was in Iraq, you said? Yeah, so I was on, okay. uh, in 2003, my unit, we deployed to Iraq for okay. the invasion. So we staged out of Kuwait for a month or so, or however long we were there, and then eventually jumped into Iraq. Okay. Air, uh, Air of John? No, so we were at this little place called Camp 35. It was out in the middle mm -hmm. of nowhere. Okay. And the Army, like, like they literally came in and built a helipad that held, I don't know, we probably had 30 Chinooks there. Oh, wow. And so it was us to the other unit and we, it was like an old tank brigade headquarters area. Yeah. It was like East or West of Kuwait city. And um, so we were out there by ourselves. just yeah. hanging out. When you left Iraq the first time, did you ever think in, in your head, like you would be back again? Um, You know, kind of, we, um, we left, we actually left early. We kind of, okay. I would say we snuck out of country. Our commander was super cool, dude. Glenn Moore, you probably never see this, but um, he, we had, we technically, there were orders saying that we were going to be going to Afghanistan like in a year. Okay. And so he really pushed that hard. He's like, hey, we're going to Afghanistan. We got to get home. So we ended up only being in, in Iraq for like, I think, I think it was like seven or eight months. Okay. Um, instead of a full year like everyone else, because we thought we were going to go right back to Afghanistan. Um, I mean, I traveled all over that country, that deployment, and it was, I, I didn't think we would be there as long as we have been, but mm -hmm. I definitely knew we weren't going to just be there for like, you know, a year or two. Cause it was, there was a lot to do. Yeah. Jeez. What, uh, what time frame were you there again? So I was there from, uh, Oh three. I was there from, gosh, I think we left sometime in February. Okay. And we got home July or August. I want to say late, like late July, early August. Hmm. All right. Did you, uh, at any point in time when you're flying around, uh, have any like mechanical issues or, or, um, you know, lost yeah. an engine um, or anything? Or I remember we were, I think we were doing, um, we had done a mission where we went down South to Kuwait and we were coming back up to Balad where we were stationed and we stopped in Talil which is this little air base way far in the South. And we, I want to say we had an oil pressure issue. We had to shut the engine down after we left Talil. Oh no. And Talil was run by the Marines and it was like, a, it was a dust bowl. It was awful. It was like the worst place in the world to be. So we were like, well, it's probably smarter to go back to Talil, but we're going to push on to Balad so we can get home. And so we ended up flying single engine for a couple hours, I think, uh, oh, wow. getting back to Balad. Uh, and it was, it was no big deal. That helicopter is more than capable of flying. Single. And, and I might be exaggerating, you know, stories grow and memories fade. <laughs> yeah. Fishes but, uh, grow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we, the, the helicopters definitely, you know, the sand took their toll on them. We did a lot of, of, you know, all of our stuff was off airfield landing for the most part. Oh yeah. You know, we were refueling Rat people or, or refitting, taking ammo, taking supplies, taking water, whatever that, that the, you know, the soldiers that were actually doing the fighting needed, yeah. uh, you know, we took them or we'd actually go get them. So uh, you know, the, the sand took its toll in the helicopter. I think for the most part, we had some phenomenal maintainers and, and they all did a really good job of keeping those helicopters flying. That's good. And then, uh, after that, you, you guys went back to Korea. Is that true? No. So I, that was a deployment out of Savannah actually. So I was oh, in Korea Savannah. for a year okay. uh, from September 01 to September 02. 
went to Savannah, got there, you know, September. We deployed in February, got back in July or August. And then um, we actually ended up getting, they, they reorganized the entire Army's aviation, all the brigades. So the Chinooks used to be a core asset, a, a core level asset, and they put them at the brigade level. So um, we, they, they, well, they organized the third combat aviation brigade at third ID. So we ended up staying there for about a year. And then we deployed again in 2005 in January and we got home in 2006 in January. Wow. Back, uh, Iraq again, or yep, back to Iraq. Okay. Same in uh, Kuwait area or were you? Different? No, we were, so we were in Taji, which is okay. Just North of Baghdad. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Nice. Um, and then when you got back, is that when you transitioned to King Airs or how did that, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, so honestly, I didn't want to go back to Fort Rucker. Okay. So I was due for the captain's course, like the school, um, as a cap, as an O three. You were, you were commissioned officer. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was due to go back to this school, to, to Fort Rucker, to the captain's career course. And honestly, I just didn't want to go to Fort Rucker. I wanted to see something else, do something different. Sure. And, uh, one of my, one of my leaders was like, Hey, have you ever thought about going fixed wing? And I'm like, well, how do I do that? <laughs> yes. That sounds awesome. Actually. I thought airplanes were boring. I thought they yeah. were boring. They can't hover. Like they, they, they're just, they're dumb. Right. <laughs> That's what I thought at the time. Yep. yep. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I, the guy was like, yeah, if you go to the MI, the military intelligence captain's career course, you can, you know, you get a top secret clearance and you can, maybe you'll get a transition and go fly King airs or jets or whatever, but sure. uh, you'll go to Arizona for the course. So I'm like, Oh, that, that'd be good to like, you know, broaden my horizons and, and get a little more well-rounded. So yeah. um, I applied for it and got accepted for it. And, and then, you know, put me through the, got my clearance and came in a PCS tier to Fort, to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Sure. Yep. Um, and did the school, which was like six months long and got the transition. So then I went back to Fort Rucker for three months and got the, or two months, was it three months, three months, three months in Fort Rucker. And then I came back here to Fort Huachuca to do the um, SEMA course, the Special Electronic Mission Aircraft, SEMA, okay. Okay. Uh, which is now going away. Uh, but oh, really? so the schoolhouse here was so basically anyone that was going to fly military intelligence type missions, ISR for yeah. the Army, would come through Fort Huachuca. Okay. So I came back here again. So I was here for about a year. My family's here for about a year. I was gone for most of it. Um, but then at that point, I was a qualified, you know, military intelligence aviator. Yeah, um, and I went back to Savannah, where we had just left, to fly King Airs out of Savannah. Oh, really? Yeah. And did your family stay in Fort Huachuca area, or? So they stayed on Fort. Like we had a house on Fort Huachuca through the military. Um, so they were here for the year, and then when we moved back to Savannah, we moved back to Savannah, bought a house there, and we were there for almost four years. Oh wow! Okay. And then flying. Uh, your what were your missions like out of Savannah, or were you at that point like? A little bit more administrative, less actual. No, time. and that was you know that was really the main benefit of going fixed wing that okay. I saw is because who like who we worked for, um, we didn't really have a lot of staff positions outside of the unit at the time. Okay. Um. So I ended up staying in the cockpit a lot longer. Bottom oh, wow. line, I was able to fly longer. So I got to Savannah, um, and uh, our unit deployed about five months after I got there. And so I went on that deployment. We were gone for nine months and that was a great deployment. You know, I learned how to fly the airplane. I flew as a first officer, basically the sure. whole time. Um, really learned a lot about the King air. We were flying what's called an RC 12 sure. N model, I guess at the time. So um, hmm. RC 12 N. What, what kind of uh, avionics package did you have in there? Universal. Okay. Uh, mostly one. What's that? UNS one or yeah, UNS one. Okay. Uh, but we, but it was, it was a, um, oh, it was an INS. Okay. And it took oh. like 45 minutes to align for a full mission alignment. So <laughs> at times, yeah, it was awesome. But, um, but it, you know, the key, the King Air that the army flies or that one, the RC 12s, it was basically a King Air 200, yeah. but we had, um, the dash 67s. Okay. For the motors and then we had like beach 1900 empennage tail landing gear okay so it was like a bastardized king air if you will that was kind of beefed up 
Um, yeah, and and had uh, like higher landing weight, you know. Yeah, we were like I think yeah. our max like takeoff weight or taxi weight was like sixteen five or sixteen two. Oh, wow, that's like three hundred three fifty. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it's that's... three it's three hundred numbers for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So interesting. Flew that for a deployment, and then went, okay. and then I finally got an deployment to Afghanistan for about three months. Um, okay. After that, and then I went back to Iraq again out of Savannah with Task okay. Force O. Did that? Oh, for okay. Um, and where? Then, hold on, uh, back up in Afghanistan. Were you flying out of um, Bagram or? I was in Kandahar that time. Kandahar. Okay. Okay. Yep. And then um, in, under Odin, wh- where were you flying out of? Uh, we were at. Oh, what was the place called? Spiker to crit. Spiker, yeah. Okay. Oh, Spiker. Yeah. Um Spiker and then all and then um was it Ali Asaleem? Uh yeah. I mean that well that is an air base, but that that's not it. It was the one that was our alternate when we were up in our bill. Uh man. Now you're asking me the question. Shoot, I should have <laughs> Yeah, sure. Al Assad. No, Al Assad. Al Assad. Al Assad. Yeah, yeah. Al Assad. Al-Assad. Yeah. So yeah. I said so was it Spiker then we went to Al Assad. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then uh, Erbil compared to Al Assad, uh, which one do you like better? <laughs> yeah, it's not even a question. Yeah. yeah like I would, a... I legitimately, like one hundred percent, not lying. I would take my wife to Erbil. Oh yeah, no, one hundred percent. I felt very safe there as well. Absolutely. And, but I would go as a tourist. Yeah. I think it's an awesome city. The yeah. people are amazing. I would go back in a heartbeat. Al Assad. I don't ever plan on seeing that place again. Yeah, yeah. I felt that way about Bagram. I haven't really gone uh, anywhere else other than uh, Bagram and, and uh, Erbil, but yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, and then, uh, so you were deploying out of Savannah, and then you came back from Iraq in, you know, all side or whatever, back to Savannah, or did you go? Yeah, so there? I came back to Savannah, but I was actually on orders to come to Fort Huachuca. Okay. And I was going to be out here at the schoolhouse. As uh, an instructor? or As a staff officer. Okay. okay. So, but again, I still got to fly like at least once a week and I wasn't yeah. an instructor. So I just kind of just joy ride to King air once a week. There you go. <laughs> so that was a good time. Again, had a lot of good friends that I, that I, that we, we had a great team, a lot of good staff officers and great instructors. I still keep in contact. Like those are the guys I still keep in contact with the most probably. Cool. Um, and we'd go and grab lunch somewhere and learn how to fly the King air. And, and so we had a lot of fun with that. Um, ferried a couple King Airs from Korea, which was fun. That and then, that would be a hell of a flight too, especially coming up uh, from. All right, yeah, from oh, like over the Pacific, yeah, up and over. It was in February, so uh, there was something wrong with like one of the instrument approaches, like on Wake Island or one of those. So we couldn't go the southern route, so we had to go the northern route. Oh, uh, it was it was a fun trip. It was like it was almost thirty days, but it was only. It should have only been like I think it was like five days of flying, <laughs> maybe six at the most. I can't even remember, but the thirty days of travel. It was nice. thirty days that we were gone almost. Yeah. Oh man, that's fun. We're out of everywhere in the world that you have flown. Um, just from a beauty standpoint, uh, where's your favorite place? Oh man, that's a tough one. Like, so like out of out of Bagram, we went up to like Badakhshan, like the way northeastern part of Afghanistan. Okay. You're looking like out into like China and, and Tajikistan, yeah. all those like that's beautiful, like all those mountains out there. I mean, yeah. they're almost intimidating. It seems like they go up forever. Yeah. Um, but you know, Alaska is awesome. Mm. And then um Hawaii. Yeah, I mean, Hawaii's beautiful. Hawaii, yeah. Um I, I don't know, Alaska's pretty cool though. Okay, nice. Um, what do you have a line right now for, for your company? I do. do you, are you kind of feeling, okay. What's no, your, I, I've what's been your a line holder since pretty much day one. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Nice. The growth is just so phenomenal that, um, I, I think I sat reserve one month. Okay. All right. What's your normal, like, what's your normal routine or um, what's your normal work schedule? Like I spent, so I, I, I'm not quite senior enough to hold all Hawaii trips. Okay. Uh, so I spent most of the summer doing mostly like a lot of Cancun and okay. El Salvador. Where where are you uh, based out of? L.A. Oh, okay, L.A. Okay. So you you do you commute there and then pick yep. up and then go? Okay. Yeah. So I I, I retired at Fort Huachuca still. So I live in Sierra Vista and okay. um and which it's funny because I hated this place when I lived here in 06. Like I couldn't wait to leave. 
Really? So back six years later, and it was okay. And and I ended up. It was only supposed to be two years, and that was eleven years ago. <laughs> and from we're in our forever of, house. From from all of our interactions, it, I've always gotten the impression that you're like Arizona born and bred. And it's interesting that you say that. <laughs> no, I mean I I'm totally one hundred percent in on Arizona for sure. Okay. All right, uh, but no, I was I was raised in Oklahoma, basically. Oh, you were okay. Where were you born? Uh, Alaska. Alaska. Okay. Al- born in Alaska. Military and kid. then yeah, military kid, obviously. When uh you said your dad uh, passed away when you were younger. How old? Yeah, were like you? ten. Oh wow. Jeez, I'm sorry. Uh, you, thanks. Yeah. Do you have uh you said you had a brother? Do you have any other siblings? No, just a just a younger brother. Younger brother. Okay. How much younger is he with three years? Three years. Okay. Where's he at? He's up in Alaska. He's in okay. the uh, Alaska National Guard. Oh, Alaska nice. Guard. All right. Does he, is he a pilot like you or does he? No, he's, in, he's uh, enlisted. So he enlisted when infantry and um, he, he was, he did way more harder, like way harder things than I could have ever done. I really? think yeah. um, he, he's, he's a stud. He's, he's a good cool. kid. That's cool. And you were able to fly with him too. That seems like very rare. Yeah. That's so awesome. it's funny. Like I, so like in Iraq, in Oh three, I found out where he was. And he was, this is before, like, the Scuds had started flying, but we hadn't, like, crossed the line. We were still in the air campaign. And so I found out where he was, and I flew up, and I got dropped off. And I just, like, wandered around, like, hey, has anybody seen the 101st? Where's the 101st? And I found him and, you know, got to hang out with him for an afternoon, which is really cool. In Iraq? Yeah, in Iraq. And (laughs) then, like, so two years later... Um, he came down to Savannah and, you know, he's an ID card holder. So my boss was like, yeah, he can go fly. So sure. I took him out in the jump seat and he got to fly around the front of Sanook with me um, in, on the jump seat. And then in 2011, when I was at Odin at Spiker, he was in Baghdad. at like the, in the green zone. Sure. The last National Guard had the, their, their, their Blackhawks had like the VIP transport mission. Okay. So he was there with them. So I flew down there to visit him again. And uh, so we got to like go hit golf balls together off of Saddam's palace and all that. Really? Yeah, that was pretty cool. And actually, and I re-enlisted him that trip. Actually, now that I remember. So I, I he re-enlisted oh. on that trip. So I got to administer the oath of, you know, re-enlistment to him. That's really cool. That's so, awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. How, uh, how was it for you um, transitioning from helicopters to airplanes or... Like, was it easy for you? Was it tough? Was it like, what? Um, you know, a big part of that thing is air sense. Okay. You know, if you can manage management, you know, you can manage a flight deck, you can manage a flight deck, whether or not it's a helicopter or an airplane, managing a flight deck is managing a flight deck. So really it was just the mechanics of learning how to fly something new. that was definitely moving a lot faster and then did a whole lot more instrument flying yeah. uh, than I ever did in a helicopter. Which is yeah. funny because like I remember ferrying after Iraq the first time. So in two thousand, late two thousand three, we were turned, we were moving some air, helicopters around, and we had to fly one out to Colorado Springs from Savannah, and okay. we went VFR the whole way. Nice. Like we were, like we didn't fly, we didn't file IFR. Like we just didn't do that. No. Yeah. As a helicopter guy, we're like, now nah, we're good. Fly, you know, five hundred feet. Let's go. Yep. 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 Now, if you ask me to go out and fly VFR, I'd be like, uh, how do I like do I who do I need to talk to? Dude, what do I do? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I remember that same experience too, like uh flying a Jet Ranger up and down the East Coast. And um basically I would like 500 feet and I would like turn off my radio and I'd have music going and I'm just <laughs> not talking to anyone, not squawking, you know, 1200 or you know, just fat, dumb, and happy on my way. Yep. Yeah. Jeez. So no, so, other than, you know, just learning how to fly a new aircraft and learning new speeds, like how to make sure I'm not falling behind the airplane because it's just going faster. Yeah. Um, I learned very quickly that you can't hover an airplane. I, <laughs> I, I think I tried to a few times, um, but yeah. yep. it didn't work. Guilty. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I interviewed my, uh, my, my instructor that taught me how to fly airplanes and I taught him how to fly helicopters. Okay. And, uh, he was joking about the time that I almost killed him because I was trying to come into a hover in an airplane and apparently airplanes don't hover. Like, yeah. What? <laughs> what? What I'm do you mean? Hard yeah. I mean, decelerate as I'm coming down. That's normal, right? Yeah. That's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. Seems uh... legit. 
So yeah. over your career, you've taken a number of check rides. Um, what advice would you give for somebody new to aviation that has never taken a check ride? Oh, I mean, take it serious. Definitely hundred percent take it serious. Right. But, um, you know, study what you can realize that you, unless you're like a supercomputer, you're not going to retain everything. Um, but realize that everyone's either bombed a check ride or they should have, but the instructor was feeling a little lenient, maybe gave them a little bit of coaching during the check ride. Yeah. Um, and you know, everyone goes through that and just, pre you know, just prep for it. You know, it's all out there. There's people that have come before them, you know, you and I, people that are willing to be mentors that are willing to help people study that are willing to, to do that. Um, it's just a matter of studying and taking it serious because like I tell my kids now, like a couple of my kids, you know, I got four kids, three boys. And I, I think a couple of the boys want to be pilots. And I'm telling them like, Hey guys, you got to realize like when you fill out your application, the first thing, like one of the first things they ask you is what traffic violations have you had? So as a 16 year old, you're not thinking about that. Not at all. No. But you need to think, you know, like you need to think about what you, what you're doing and how it's going to affect you. So even though that private pilot's license or that commercial ticket, you know, that check ride may not seem as important as the ATP, it's just as important. So treat it, you know, treat it seriously. Uh, but at the same time, have fun with it. Cause this is fun. Like we get to fly yeah. around. Yeah. How awesome is that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Have you been able to take your kids up flying with you? No. So I've got a, a buddy that used to live here and he had a, a Cessna 180 and I really wanted to buy a 180 at the time. I don't own an airplane, probably never will, but I had the bug. And so I took my boys up and I took my daughter and my wife up. Cool. Um, but we never really like, it wasn't me flying the airplane necessarily. It was his airplane. Sure. Um, since then I've taken my, my daughter went with me on a Honolulu layover. And then my son went with me last month on a Cancun layover. Nice. So, unfortunately, like both my landings were phenomenal. Like they were great because <laughs> uh, I never would have heard the end of it if I had just slammed it down. <laughs> Done a, like a Navy carrier landing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What um, long, long term, like what's, uh, what's your 10 year plan? So I'm going to training at the end of this month. Oh, cool. Um, what for? 787. Nice. All right. Yeah, so I'm really excited about that. I've I've never done international other than I mean I've done international in the King Air, like in Iraq, but yeah, you've you know, done that's, some international. That, that's international, but um, yeah. I'm excited about flying a big jet and doing some longer legs and getting to see some other places in the world. And I'm gonna do that for I don't know. Honestly, I was looking today, and um, I would be like a like an, a line holder in San Francisco on the 737 as a captain. Oh wow. And I don't really want to commute to San Francisco right now. Yeah. It's an easier commute to go to LA, but um, I think I'll stay on the wide body unless they open up a base in Phoenix, which I don't know is going to happen. I mean, there's always rumors of bases opening for all the airlines, you know, you know how pilots are. We always talk. Oh yeah. About, we start rumors, but we, we start rumors <laughs> and we solidify them, but yeah. Um, yeah. And then we keep on talking about them until they yeah, just keep talking about it until it's true. So yeah. no, I think I'm gonna stay on the wide body for a few years. I'm not gonna. I'm super junior. Uh, okay. I probably will be going to landings class every three months to just get my landings currency. Okay. Uh, so go back to Denver and and fly the sim and do three landings in the sim just to keep my landings currency. Sure. Uh, probably won't fly an airplane a whole lot as a you know as a line holder first officer, but um, just the experience through the wide body thing, and then eventually probably I would say within ten years I'll I'll upgrade to the left seat. Okay. Uh, and in the 737, which it's a crazy time that I can do it now. Like I'm, I could be a line holder right now. I could upgrade right now. Um, as if, in the 737. If you switched your base, if I switch back to, oh, I could do it in, I could do it in LA too, but I'd be reserve and I still, I don't want to be reserve and a commuter. Oh, I see. Sure. Sure. Difficult. Um, so this is all you said in the 737. Are you, what, what about the 787 then? Uh, I'll be a line holder as a, as a bunkie, as an IRO. IRO. What's that? It's a release officer. So like we, okay. we fly with like one captain and either two or three first officers. Okay. And so I'll be, a, I'll be a relief officer, relief pilot. Okay. So I'll get to sit up there and push buttons, monkey see, monkey do. And sure. And, but I won't get to land it. Sure. Yeah. 
Uh, do you have a line that you're kind of going for or an idea that, oh man, it'd be, it'd be awesome to be able to go from LA to Tokyo, you know, like, or whatever. So uh, we actually, the seven, eight doesn't have a ton of destinations out of LA, okay. but, um, you know, we do, so I fly for United and we've got Tokyo, Haneda, we've got London and we normally have Tel Aviv. I don't think, but right now we don't have Tel Aviv. Okay. Uh, just do the, what's going on over there right now. And yeah. then the rest of it is uh, New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand, and then Brisbane, Melbourne, and Sydney, Australia. And oh, that's cool. It. Out of LA? Out of LA. And I could pick oh, up wow. out of base. Like if I saw a trip that was open and I wasn't working, um, you know, I could pick up a trip out of San Francisco or out of Chicago or Denver. Sure. Um, but those are the destinations that I'll mainly be going to, which I'm super excited. I've never been to Australia, never been to any of those. So yeah, yeah, be, no, I- I'm excited. Yeah, I, I think uh, Australian and or New Zealand uh, is definitely on my bucket list of of, of places to to travel. Um, out of all of the airspace that you have flown in, what has been the hardest airspace for you to fly in, or what was the most challenging airspace, or the um, airspace that was like just an ass pain? <laughs> Ooh, um, I mean, honestly, like as a student, it was just a traffic pattern. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, like I'm, I, I think back people like, like, well, you've been doing this for so long. And I'm like, I can, I remember when I didn't even know what the upwind and the crosswind was like the, the, you know, the, the instructor's like, all right, let's turn crosswind. I'm like, oh, what, what's which way is that left or right? Way, where do I go? Where do I, where right do traffic. I, go with my hands? I traffic. What does that mean? You know? So, you know, as you, I, I remember thinking that thinking like, yeah. man, I'm gonna be the dumbest guy here. Cause I don't know what he's talking about, Yeah, <laughs> but, um, I don't know. I mean, like now, Chicago is a pain in the butt. Oh, yeah. Just because they talk so fast and like yeah. you hit the ground and you've got to, like, I don't go to Chicago enough to know the standard taxi routes and which kind yeah. of the flow of taxi. And, and that's the hardest part is once you get the airplane on the ground, it's figuring out how you're going to get to the gate. Yeah. Like they're talking fast. And like, it's not just like taxiway Yankee. It's like Yankee Alpha, then Yankee Bravo. Or yeah. something. You know, so it's like, but if they pause when they say it, do you think they like, was that Yankee Alpha or is that Yankee Alpha? You know, um, airspace, I mean, it's IFR, so it's so easy. Like, you just, you know, you do. And other than a few little tricky places like Chicago, like don't accelerate past 250 until they tell you to, no matter your altitude. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, as a lieutenant flying around Korea in, Chin- in the Chinook, there was a lot of restricted airspace that we had to okay. avoid because it was their national airspace. Like, there's a ring around Seoul called the Papa 73. Prohibited, prohibited P stands for prohibited Papa 73. And the Papa 518 is the DMZ. And so you had to get special training just to go fly those routes. And uh-huh. there were checkpoints. You had to each checkpoint. You had to call checkpoints on the radio. Sure. Uh, so that was, you know, that was, again, challenging to learn, I guess, or make sure I'm not messing anything up. Unfortunately, I think in the military, I don't think I necessarily, I never got violated um, but it's easy to like, I guess it could be easy to break a rule and not necessarily get in trouble because you don't have to give your name. If no, they, sure. you know, if, if tower calls and says, Hey, what's your name? You just be like us army, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're not required. So in that sense, like it could be easy to, to really do some stupid stuff, I guess. But fortunately, I mean, we're all professionals and yeah. I never saw anybody willfully violate, you know, other than maybe Iraq. We do what we want. America. I do what I want. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So is it, I, I, I take it then it's uh, frowned upon for a United pilot to ask for a progressive taxi on the ground. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that would definitely be frowned upon. All right. All right. That's good to know. <laughs> what, uh, what advice would you give somebody just starting their aviation journey? Like, you know, zero time they want to get involved and they want to fly helicopters. Like what advice would you give them? Um, yeah, I would tell them to don't delay. And if if that's your dream, go for it. Like, just do it. Find a mentor, find a coach, find a revenue stream or how you're going to pay for it, but make it happen. Because it it is like, if, if, if it's your dream, just do it. Cause it's so much fun being a pilot. Like, I, I feel like I don't even work for a living. Like I, I have a side job flying airplanes and then, you know, I get to do things with my kids and my, my wife when I'm at home. Um, it, it's, I love going to work. I, I really do. Cause it's not even work hardly. 
Um, so yeah, just get in and do it. And, and as far as like, which, how to, how to do it and which way, like, that's a tough, you know, tough question to answer because everyone's different. Um, a funny stat about me is I've never once paid to fly ever, ever. You are lucky, sir. Like never. That's you are lucky. So, and, and I, and it is, and it's, you know, the military paid for all my training. And then when I got my ATP, the military paid for that. Yep. So, cause That's it was awesome. part of my sim ride. I had to pay for the oral or the, the written, the, but Oh, the written. And then the check ride or was the, the check, no, ride, the check was... ride was part of my sim ride that sure. I, every 18 months we had to go to the sim, sure. um, you know, and, and the military gave me some really phenomenal upset recovery training that I ever paid, you know, that they, it was part of our, you know, our budget that we paid for like a uh, T six type stuff. No, so we did it in. So the first time I did it was in an extra three hundred. Oh, are you serious? Um, yeah, dude, how fun was that? Oh, it was it was crazy. Like the first time, like it was up at with um, oh, what was the name of the company? They're in Mesa, uh, Mesa, Arizona. Okay. Um, and they're right next door to all, all ATP. But like we were doing a falling leaf, he was demonstrating a falling leaf. He's like, "It's a nice." Gen-. I'm thinking it's like a gentle falling leaf. No, dude, I was hitting my head against the canopy. It was so <laughs> violent. That airplane is like you. Just think about like doing a snap roll, and you've already done like three of them. Like if you just think about doing it, you've already done them. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's oh, a man. it's a cool aircraft. That's that sounds awesome. So the I did most- it. Man, I did a super decathlon a couple times, um, and then like. I went up and did some, some basically is off airfield flying, mountain flying, airfield flying up in Alaska. In um, uh, helicopters or fixed wing? No, fixed wing. Okay. We did a super cub. Oh, nice. Tundra yeah, tires. So I spent a week thing? up there flying. Did the army pay for that? Hell, that's it was, awesome. It was great training. You know, it was, and it, it was, you know, we were flying in like in Afghanistan. We didn't have single engine service ceiling. Like the mountain tops were higher than our single engine service ceiling in a lot of places. So, we need to know how to fly mountains and understand how to, to navigate mountains in an underpowered aircraft. Sure. And so that was like the closest thing we got to it. And and it was, I mean, yes, was it fun? Yes, but it was, it was good fun training, but it was, oh, yeah. it was worthwhile. Yeah. The training events where you, you learn a lot, but you have some fun doing it. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And so try to can... justify it the best you can to the budget people. <laughs> As to why you took 30 days to, you know, <laughs> ferry oh, an that, airplane that, from. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I really appreciate it. Um, for me personally, like, are you still doing uh the the custom stippling stuff? Or are you absolutely okay. nice? So, nice. I, and that's that's another thing I would tell people, especially like if you are gonna if you get to the majors and you make it to the majors, um, find a side gig because you, hmm. you got plenty of time. Like, I've got plenty of time to do any sort of whether your side hustle is real estate flipping houses, which I'm glad to see back in the, in the flight deck and not just working on houses, little Bob Vila style, <laughs> um, you know, whatever the case is, find something in, and because you're going to have a lot of spare time sure. um, and it's what's a great your, time. What's that? What's your uh, like normal schedule? Like, you know, I, I know like every month is different, but on average, you know, I work, you know, X number of days a month or, you know, that type of thing. On average, I'm off, I would say 16 to 18 days a month. Jeez. Nice. So nice. Um, and that's a slow, like if I want to pick up, I can definitely pick up more, more flights. Sure. Um, I try to do four day trips so that I'm commu- you know, only commuting three or One four time. times a month. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there, if you want to hustle, you can hustle and you can, you know, you can fly hundred hours a month, mm. which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's, it's, that's, that's, that's hustling. pretty good. Yeah. That, no, that is pretty good. Yeah. Interesting. I remember, uh, what is it? Shit. uh dennis uh from avenge he was like a ups uh first officer but had the seniority where he would basically like just go for currency and then like bag all of his trips or, or like trade them out or i don't know how he wheeled and dealed but he like flew like once a year it felt like you know and that was like <laughs> yeah was, there's definitely ways to game the system <laughs> oh yeah there's like i i just had a trip um that was supposed to start on monday that was bought off me for training. So I was, I was flying with a check pilot and I didn't really mean to bid with him. I don't think like I just bid my schedule. I bid commutable trips and, and I was just, I mean, I was just paired with him and I got a call from 
uh, the OE desk saying, Hey, we're buying your trip from you. So, and, and they pay protect that. So, um, so I got paid to fly the trip that I didn't fly. <laughs> that's, like, that's so awesome. I could have picked up, but I had some stuff to do around the house. So I stayed home. There you go. There you go. What, uh, what projects are you working on right now? Oh, um, you know, I've got a couple of cars I'm working on out the garage. Okay. Um, I got the scout. I do. I have a, I have two scouts. Nice. Oh, um, two now. Yeah, I've got one. But it's it's like long term project. I haven't started on it yet. Right now, I'm working on a a a two forty Z Datsun two forty Z. Really? Nineteen seventy two. Yep. Nice. What uh What are you doing to it? Uh, just like I bought it as a roller. I mean, it had the motor and train. Like everything's there. I just got to put it all together and build it back up and get it on the road. So, sure. if I want to just dump a ton of money into it, I could probably have it done in two or three weeks. But I'm kind of pacing myself so I don't go broke. Sure. Sure. But um. You know, hunting season's here, so I've been hunting a little bit. And uh, what do you hunt? Uh, deer right now is what we're hunting here in Arizona. Okay, uh, I've been also going out for coyotes, trying to thin the coyote. There's a ton of coyotes here. Do you need so, a tag for them, or is it just no, like just a go pulse? Shoot them. <laughs> just shoot them. <laughs> just shoot them. <laughs> All right, nice. So that's cool. That's about it. I mean, just you know, just getting ready to go to training, which is going to be. Um, I think it'll be better this time. Like I didn't know what okay. to expect last time, so now that I know what to expect, and it's a Boeing aircraft, yeah, uh, it should be a little easier. But again, just like I say to new people, like I'm going into it expecting the worst and trying to be as prepared as I can be, so I don't look all jacked up when I get there. Don't be that guy. <laughs> yeah, don't be that guy. <laughs> that's cool. And then that's in Denver, is it? Or yeah, so uh, our training is all our training facility in Denver. We got. I don't even know. And I don't want to necessarily plug United. I, I love it. Like the culture is great for me. Um, and, but we've got, I think we've got more Sims than anyone else out there. Oh, wow. uh, we, we just, we got a ton of Sims and a ton, a huge training footprint. I guess pre COVID we used to rent them out to other companies that needed Sim time, but now we just ramped up growth so much that, that uh, they keep them going like nice. all day, all night. Are they, uh, is are the airlines right now hiring? Yes, absolutely. Okay, we got we we got new hires going to captain. Wow, right in the captain seat. Right, I mean, it, there's some stipulations in the contract, and sure, you know, but the, so they got to finish probation, which is a year, but okay. they're getting paid as a captain from like 300 hours. Jeez, which is a lot of money. Nice. Are you gonna um, you think retire out of United? Absolutely. Yeah. Once, uh, pretty much, once you go to a major. Um, other than once you've gone past a year or so, you really don't want to be jumping around a lot because it's all based on seniority True. and your seniority starts over when you go somewhere new. Um, and I, I would say, you know, if you've got listeners that are looking at trying to get to the majors, uh, don't stop trying do, you know, pay for the app review. If you've got the hours and you're wondering why you're not getting a call, find the company that, is a is the best fit for you as far as like application reviews and okay. interview prep um because that's a big part of it and a lot of people maybe are a little worried about spending the money i, I probably spent 1200 bucks i would say getting ready for my interview and that's oh, okay. that's like my application review printing my logbook out and getting it bound and nice and pretty um in the interview prep the technical interview prep like because there's an hr and there's a technical okay. um and so all that stuff, all said and done, like going to like all these different websites, paying whatever, 15, 20 bucks here and 30 bucks there to see um, to past experiences, what other people experienced because you got to pay for it and all these services, whatever. But, be, you know, being as prepared as you possibly be because it literally is a multi-million dollar career. Mm -hmm. And I probably won't ever get there because I'm a little older. I'm 47. Um, but, you know, someone that's 24, 25, just got their commercial and they're trying to grind out the time, like grind it out, get it done. Um, because it's, I mean, it's a lucrative career mm. and and it's, it's not even work. It's not even work. Yeah, no, that's you know, awesome. I, I flew the, I have a captain I flew with and uh, he lives in Texas. He owns like, he owns like a helicopter and like four airplanes and not just airplanes, MIGs. What? They're like MIG 17s, MIG 19s. He's like, oh yeah, they're like 40,000 or whatever. I don't even know what he said they cost, but He's got like some little scout helicopter that's British 
that he just had flown over from Britain. Like he's he's British. He was in the Royal yeah. Air Force. Super cool dude. And that's the one of the things that I love the most about um outside the military is everyone is awesome. Like I have not flown with a single dude that was just like, okay, you are weird. I mean, we keep you weird guys, but like no, just like like no one yells at you. Yeah. I couldn't believe my first landing that I didn't get like slapped upside the head. Because like I planted, I think it was into Portland. And I guarantee you, I stroked every bit of strut that that 737 had. Like there was flare. I don't know what a flare was, but I didn't. <laughs> I hit down so hard. You're I'm trying to. Like, G meters weren't going off or there wasn't a crack in the runway, something like it was so bad. And the instructor just looked at me and he's like, all right, uh, maybe right. try a little more flare next time. Yeah, try, try and flare. <laughs> I'm like, a little more. Like, that was a lot. He's like, you didn't do any. You didn't do any. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but you were, you were trying to get the arresting hook wire to catch, right? I definitely was. Yeah. I, I, what I was, it was, everything was just coming so, honestly, it was just coming so fast. It was, like, moving so fast. I was like, I think I froze. I don't know what I did. But, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know. It's just a different experience. But, sure. Like, at the end of the day, uh, nobody, nobody, everyone's a professional. Good. Everyone, you know, is kind. Everyone loves coming. Like, I haven't flown with anyone that's grumpy and like, I hate this place. Like, I'm burned to the ground. Like, it's literally a really good work environment. That's awesome. Um, so that's the other thing, I guess, if I could give some advice to people, like when they're looking mm -hmm. at um, where they want to work, especially in this, I don't know how it is on the helicopter side right now, as far as like the job market and how the opportunities, but you know, if you're, you're sitting at 2000 hours and you get your ATP, um, you you're hireable just about anywhere. Yeah. And so really take a look at the culture of the different companies that you're looking at living in base is always going to be the best thing. Like I don't live in base and being a commuter sucks. Yeah. That's the worst part of my job is getting to work and getting yeah. home from work. Once I'm there, it's fine. Um, so if you can live in base, do it. Uh, I personally don't want to live anywhere that our bases are. So we're, you know, we're staying here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, look at the culture, look at the financial reports, look at, you know, deep dive into that stuff because you're mm. potentially going to be there for the next 20 to 40 years. I mean, the, the youngest guy in my class was 25 years old. Wow. That's a 40 year career. That is. Yeah. And it's wow. a, it's a multi million dollar career. Yeah. So um, you know, just to look at stuff and, and figure out what's the best fit for you. I had a class date with Delta as well as United. Oh, really? Um, and I really thought Delta was my number one choice. Yeah. But looking at the commutes and looking and looking at the opportunities to fly the wide body um, and the culture, I felt like it was a better fit for me to go to United. Um, you know, and looking back, I don't have any regrets with that. I've sure. got some friends at, at, at Delta and they love it. And I'm sure that if I was there, I'd love it too. Sure. Uh, but I think it was at the time for me, it was a better fit. And now, you know, I'm going to seven, eight, seven training, which is kind of what I wanted to be doing was wide body stuff. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, look at, look at, take a holistic view at everything. Sure. But again, nothing's permanent. I've got buddies that flew Chinooks with me and then they went to like border patrol and flew Blackhawks. Mm -hmm. Then they learned how to fly airplanes and went to like Envoy or Mesa or Sky West. And they sure. did that. Um, and you know, then they finally get a job at like spirit or frontier. And they did that for a little bit until they finally got a call from American or United or Southwest. Mm -hmm. And then they finally end up there, mm -hmm. you know, and they, so you finally end up at your destination where you want to be for the rest of your life. Yeah. Of course, where you're at, when you're interviewing, that place is where you want to be the rest of your life. If you're yeah, interviewing at Sky West, that's where you want to be yeah. forever, even though what? they know that you're probably lying to them. Give me uh like the big I don't know thirty thousand foot view of like the interview process for for United like what was what was the process like how long did it take you know like what was um, you that? know it was only by probably about thirty minutes okay. um they they brought us in and we all it was like twelve of us and you know dressed in suits and nice clothes and everything and um, we handed our logbooks in right away and then we then they call us back one by one and or the you know a pilot came and grabbed me. And took us back to a room and there was an HR uh, rep there as well. And so the HR, you know, they introduced themselves first, the pilot and the HR rep. And then it was just kind of like, Hey, so, you know, tell us about yourself. So, you know, quick, like three to five minutes. And and this is where interview prep really is, you know, pays for itself because knowing what to say, what not to say, 
how to say it, when to say it, what order mm -hmm. to say, it. you know, do you go chronological? Well, there I was coming out of the birth canal and I had wings on my head, you know, <laughs> and I knew from day one, I was going to be a pilot. Well, I've wanted know? to work for United since I was born. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. um, you know, but they, so then they, they, they do that. And then, um, then they ask you, you know, everyone's heard about, tell me about a time, T-M-A-A-T, mm -hmm. tell me about a time. So tell me about a time you had a disagreement with your co-pilot. Mm. Or tell me about a time you broke a rule or, you know, so they're asking, they ask you like four or five of those, just kind of fill you out kind of see what, how you answer those. And then we took a break and we came back in and then the, um, the pilot took over and he asked me to give a takeoff briefing. So he gave me some numbers and he said, Hey, go ahead and give me a takeoff briefing. Like, and he didn't expect me to know the United way. He just okay. wanted it the way that we did. So I did it how we did it at MAG. Okay. Uh, you know? When you say takeoff briefing, you're, is it like prepping passengers for takeoff type of thing? No, or is like it you briefing the, two the pilots. departure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just so the two you're, pilots. Like just departure. What, what you would brief on a takeoff in the sense okay. of like, what are we going to do in an engine failure? Okay. Um, you know, what's our alternate? Are there any safety considerations? That kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and so we did that. And then he, we kind of just chair flew. He's like, all right, so now you've taken off and you're talking to, you know, center and this light comes on he pulls out a big old panel and he points to a light i'm like well that's a master caution so <laughs> i was like i would i would probably pull out the checklist he's in this we pull turns his ipad around it's all automated he's like all right here's the checklist and so i like find it and look search for it and i found it and i'm like all right i would do this and i know nothing about 737 sure, so i'm like this yeah. is what i would do this is what i do and he'd say okay um so it says land as soon as possible or you know whatever it said he's yeah. like so we need to land here's your three options of where you can go mm. and you know they were all about the same distance and um maybe one had great weather but had no united help whatsoever sure they had like it was just like a runway that was really long but like no terminal hardly so you had to deal with passengers yeah, sure. and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Less, and then one of them like was a united hub but it had like thunderstorms and 100 foot visibility or something the 100 foot yeah. ceiling you know, eighth mile visibility. Sure. And then the other one was like further away, like barely like into your reserve fuel. And so mm. they just want to see your, your critical thinking and how you're going to react and sure. what you're going to choose and why you're going to choose it. You know, be able to explain, well, this is why I chose that one. Sure. Um, so it, what, what did you choose and why? I don't remember. Dude, it was okay. all her. <laughs> I was so nervous. It was like the first job interview I'd ever done. Was it? Oh, it was yeah. like in the army, I didn't really interview for anything. No, yeah, you just yeah, like yeah. you want to be a pilot. Like, yeah, I want to be a pilot. Like, sure. well, I'll pass this well there you test. go. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, though, it, they they made me feel laid back. They made me feel yeah. welcome. They made me feel like I was already part of the team. Um, oh. And then they, you know, they took us back out and they said, you know, you'll hear from us within a week. There you go. And I remember I got a I got an email. Um, like a week later, I was like, literally, I don't remember being as excited about anything as when I got an email with the CJO saying, you you know, you've been offered, you're being offered a position at United. Uh, like I was on cloud nine. Like it was, it was the most Dude. amazing. Cause I never in a million years did a, a, a kid from Oklahoma that yeah. wanted to fly helicopters his whole life. Think that he would be at a major airline, a legacy yeah. airline. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it, that was never even in my 30,000 foot view, never in my view at all. Cool. And so I like during OE, like the first, when I would call just for taxi, I would almost get giddy saying, Hey, this is United one, two, three, because I'm like, well, that's, that's me. You know, I'm United now. You know, it's Dude, like, that's awesome. It was cool. Like I really felt like, like I, I, I don't know, like I accomplished something, but something I never yeah. thought was ever possible. Were you, uh, were you still working at MAG at the time? No. So I, so I left MAG when Lidos came on board. Okay. And I was the assistant site lead at, at Lidos. Oh, wow. Kind of like the lead. I, I wasn't really a lead. I was, you know, we still had like the Rob Carpenters and Brian Erickson's. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was there kind of as the pilot liaison between MAG and, and Lidos because Lidos was the, the prime. Okay. Um, was that, uh, what is that, 2020, I guess? Yeah, it was 2021. 21. Okay. Late 2020, early 2021. Okay. And then I went over there and did that. And then um still still at um Urbil. Yep. Okay. And so did that for a couple of rotations and then got the uh job or the interview. Dude, I literally like I went 
I got the, I didn't even get the interview invite. I got the Hogan invite, which is like this personality test you got to take hmm. like ahead of time. Okay. As soon as I got that, but it's proctored. Like they like, you, they have a camera on while you're doing it. Oh, so, sure. Like I went and shaved that. Like I went to the barber like that night. I had <laughs> In Interville? Yeah. I went, I had shaved like four years and I'm like, I was like, all right, we're doing it. <gasps> oh shit. Did uh did everybody like whoa Chris what what happened? Yeah, they didn't know who I like. So like dudes wouldn't even talk to me. They thought I was some new guy. You know how it is when a new guy comes. Yeah, like, I'm uh, that's he's, gotta, he's gotta prove himself first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. People weren't even talking to me. They thought I was just some new guy running around. So you you took the proctor exam in Erbil. So <laughs> I did the proctor exam in Erbil, and I did ninety percent of my interview prep in Erbil. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. All my free time I was doing interview yeah. prep. Nice. And then, um, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that offer uh, Spitfire, Raven, uh, Emerald Coast. Um, some of them specialize in sort of like Ascend Above, specialize with United. Okay. And so um, I did Emerald Coast and Ready, Set, Take Off and Checked and Set. And okay. those are the three different programs I use. But like Emerald Coast has what they, you know, Rapid Fire where they, well, there'll be like 20 people in a Zoom call and you're all, they'll, they'll say, all right, Chris, tell me about a time, the blah, blah, blah. And so you give your answer and everyone else gets to hear it, oh, which helps okay. you also jog your memory. Like, oh yeah, I was in a situation like that once. And I guess I could see how I could like mold my story to work for that question. Oh, that's cool. Uh, so I was doing those for my rack and then I was, and then I was doing the one on, we did a couple of one-on-ones. Okay. Um, I did that for my rack. Cause I think I got home and then like three days later, I went to Denver to interview. Dude, that's awesome. So yeah, it was, and then I went and then I got the job offer and I was super stoked, but then I still wasn't a hundred percent sure I didn't want to go to Delta. So mm-hmm. I went to the Delta interview. I went to Africa for like 10 days and slayed some animals. Uh, <laughs> you went hunting. Yeah. I took my daughter, oh, um, cool. John Colin. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So we went down there. It was so much fun. Colin's that's so cool. freaking awesome. That's and, awesome. Um, so we went down there and hunted for like five or six days. It was gone like eight or 10 days total. Whereabouts? Uh, South Africa. Okay. And then I got home and like three days later, I went to Delta and, wow. and did that interview and got the job offer there. And so then I was like, then I had to think about it. And I kept delaying it. I didn't want to like make it. Cause that's like, once you tell them, no, you like burn yeah. that way, it's done. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what, uh, what made you, what, what was the straw that broke the camel's back for United versus Delta? Honestly, um, I didn't really have a lot of people that I knew personally on like a, on a personal level that were at Delta. Okay. And I knew people at United that could, they, they, so they were talking it up, you know, sure. and they were like, Oh, it's so great. We do this and this and this. And so I kind of started to swing towards United. And then yeah. I was looking at the the commuting, like our, our training headquarters in Denver, you know, they're in Atlanta. It's Atlanta. a, much longer commute like my first base would probably be new york yeah where yeah, i could go to yeah. san francisco or la for my first base yeah sure so th- there was just a-, a few things that culturally were just different and i think i mean it's like ford chevy dodge you know when you're paying ninety thousand dollars for a truck it's going to be a nice truck no matter what you get yeah um, unless it's a dodge unless it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm not ford or dodge guy so <laughs> That's funny. But uh, so yeah, it was just one of those things where I don't think I could have made a wrong choice. It's like sure. it was like in flight school at Fort Rucker. You know, I got Chinooks, um, and there weren't there were six Chinook slots, and I got the last one. So I was okay. like the last smart, last dumb guy, I guess. I don't know. Last they went pretty guy. quick though. Um, he, but well, let me ask you this: like, I I don't know much. Like, is Chinook sought after, or is it like everyone wants Blackhawks, or everyone? I don't know, wants it just Pat- depends. Like, like it okay. depends on the class. You know, some guys they really want Apaches, but there may only be like five Apache slots and then okay. 20 Blackhawk slots. Okay. Um, and it's all based on order of merit. So okay. how you, how well you do all your check rides and your, and your uh, written exams and basically all your exams, all your check rides and they rank and stack you. And so the, like literally it's like, there's, there's no surprise. It's like, okay, you're number one in the class. What do you want to pick? Yeah. And so they have number one stand up. And I think I was like number eight or something. And so I got the last Chinook or eight or 10 or something like that. Um, so, but I'm sure that if I had been in Blackhawks, I'd have been freaking just as, I mean, at the end of the day, you're still flying. Like, yeah, it, it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So no, that's true. I don't know. I can't, I, I couldn't see me flying anything else than a, than a Chinook at the time, 
but because again my culture like my personality i'm kind of laid back yeah. chill um i don't think i would as i don't i don't know if i'd have fit into that type a personality of the of the patchy guys necessarily yeah. at the same time i know a ton of patchy dudes and i think they're the greatest people ever so uh eric yeah. Inier. oh yeah i forget about it yeah yeah so yeah i think he's a patchy guy he's a cab guy oh yeah he's... hope he sees this <laughs> I don't oh, know. I, awesome. He texted me today, actually. Oh, really? Um, nice. Yeah. You still keep in contact with anyone? Um, you know, I talked to a few guys from from Erbil, not a ton. Um, I think Denny messaged me a couple months ago because he was coming down here for like a hunt or or no, he's bringing an aircraft in for something. Oh, okay. He's doing something like up in Tucson. Nice. Um, so I texted, you know, I text Denny. I talked to John Colin occasionally um some of the crew members definitely talk to them more than the pilots for some reason but um i still keep in contact with some of the guys i mean honestly that was like to me it was the best job that you could have after the military because you still work you know as a military guy i'm still around the military yeah how many times do we say it was like going to summer camp where we get to live in bunk beds and it it was i truly yeah no i with all of the ass pain of like, you know, uh, the food trucks not coming into, you know, you know, and so we're on MREs for, you know, three months, like whatever, like all of the ass pain that, that was associated with it. I genuinely had a lot of fun and I'm glad I, I did it. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Man. <laughs> yeah. And I, I enjoyed the travel too. For me, like, unlike you, it sounds like, uh, you know, kind of throughout your career, you'd been traveling a bunch. The, the first time I left the United States, I mean, I went to, you know, Cancun and I went on a cruise when I was 13, but that's like, you know, benign, right? You know, Cozumel, Grand Cayman and Jamaica. Anyways. I did that first, same so, cruise. Oh, did you really? That's funny. Yeah, I was 10. Um, Love oh, it. there you go. Nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the first time other than that, like leaving the US was me like landing in, uh, let's see, I, w- I went through the... Um, in texas and then from texas we went to new hampshire landed in new hampshire because i took the rotator and then landed in uh romstein or or something yeah yeah in and then from there it was a landed in kuwait and then i was like you know in kuwait for the first time that was and then from kuwait i flew to doha doha to erbil or to baghdad baghdad to erbil and it was like a very eye-opening experience i was kind of a sheltered kid uh, as it were but you know i just i truly enjoyed that season of my life like traveling it was a lot of fun a lot, yeah. a lot of fun so no, i agree i i love i love getting out and i've been to places and like i love going to el salvador it's a, oh, yeah? a, lot of, a lot of people don't like going down there it's but it's pretty cool what's your connection down there uh well it's just one of our one of our uh we fly out of there nonstop from la okay or Houston. Oh, okay all right or yeah Dallas, I think. all right and then how how are your kids doing or how, how how old are they and then how are they doing i guess uh they're good you know my daughter she's 20 okay. um she's a sophomore at the university of arizona taking studying like finance she's gonna be a financial planner that's awesome she's gonna tell me to quit spending money on toys probably but whatever they're investments yeah investments yeah uh, my, my son is 18 and he's uh getting ready to serve a mission for our church for two cool. years he's going to go to columbia bottom oh. wow okay and then uh, my twin boys are almost 16 i can't wait till they turn 16 and i get to add them to the insurance because it's not expensive enough as it is oh two boys i spend, I spend like 700 dollars a month on car insurance 700 a month <laughs> Do you like have full like comprehensive on the deuce and a half? Like what? How do you? Oh no, that's separate. The five ton is that's like seven hundred dollars a year. <laughs> seven. I, I mean, I got month. like seven. I think I got like seven or eight vehicles insured. I'm not sure how. Oh, many. okay, okay. Yeah, All it's right. not just two. There's there's yeah. a few cars out there. There's a few cars out there. Yeah, man. Last I remember, uh, you had just purchased that house um, with the swimming pool and and all that. Yep. Fun jazz. Just, you still there or did oh, you? Oh yeah, that's okay. yeah, it's it's awesome. I just put solar on it this past summer. Oh, that's um, awesome. Hell yeah. And so yeah, it's our forever home. I'm not going anywhere. Good. Now so, were you were the twins uh like super involved in uh, mountain biking or is that your your other your so other my story? it's my all three boys. Okay, um all three. Okay. I got so of the twins though, the one of them is racing, like he's basically year round cycling. Okay. Um, one of them, like he just, the season just finished. So the other one's playing basketball right now, Oh, cool! Uh, but the one that's year round, like he, he took fifth at nationals two years ago 
wow. uh, in cross country in his age category. Damn. And we're planning on going to nationals again this year. Nice. So we'll see how he does, but yeah, he's, we're pretty serious with it. I definitely spend, I spend more money on cycling than I do on guns. <laughs> well, that's a good, you know, claim to fame. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I don't know. Not really. <laughs> what, uh, what kind of stippling projects are you working on? Um, I really, I kind of tapered back right now. I'm not taking a okay. lot of work in, okay. um, just cause I'm getting ready to go to training. Sure. sure so, sure, sure. um, but you know, it's always the Glocks and SIGs. That's yeah. 90% of it's Glocks and SIGs. Right. If I were to uh, send you a gun with no time constraints uh, whatsoever, uh, how much would it cost for you to stipple it for me? For you? Yeah. I agree. Don't worry about it. No, 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 no. How much? Uh, I'll, t- I'll take care of you. <laughs> I, uh, I I still am very proud of the, the AR that you built uh, for Stamp. In, Dude, those in- things are awesome. Dude, I love showing that. There's only 33 in existence, I think. Is it really? I think so. 